Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast, Episode 535, Understanding What Your Doctor Means When They Say, Standard of Care. BioBalance Health features conversations about anti-aging medicine. Your host is Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating the symptoms of aging. Dr. Maupin and Brett Newcomb are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about testosterone replacement therapy for women, and Got Testosterone, a book that helps men choose the most effective and safe form of testosterone replacement. These books are available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at BioBalance Health in St. Louis and in Kansas City. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. Thank you for joining us for our HealthCast on Dr. Lingo. I know there's many things we could talk about about Dr. Lingo, but one of the things that people misunderstand the most is something called guidelines, medical guidelines, and um, the standard of care. I even under mis- misunderstood this. Over time, uh, maybe 15, 20 years ago, I wanted to become a medical expert and uh, look at cases for patients who had been injured or for doctors who had been accused of malpractice unjustly. And um, partially that was because my husband's a lawyer and because I wanted to understand what he does. And he did medical defense. So to do that, you have to do both sides. You have to do, uh, you have to do plaintiff work, which means the patients are complaining about a doctor, or you ha- and you have to do the work that defends doctors from patients who are accusing them unjustly. So I had to look at many, many cases, and I asked my husband to teach me about the standard of care, which is what we judge medical care uh, against when we are looking at, at a medical malpractice case. Now, standard of care, in my mind, from my training in medicine, to me meant the highest level of care you could possibly offer. And I think that's what most doctors think, that it's the highest level of care. But in reality, standard of care means the very lowest level of care that a doctor can offer a patient without being negligent. Let me restate that. It's the lowest level of care. It's the least your doctor can do without committing malpractice. Well, that was news to me, and I started looking at things much differently after that and started looking at the different terms that doctors use and I was using prior to, prior to that learning process to be a medical expert. So um, one of the things that uh, I looked at when I, was, when I was looking at cases was the standard of care is, is developed by doctors' organizations like the American College of OBGYN and other, like the American College of Surgery. They list guidelines that doctors are supposed to follow to provide the lowest level of service. I guess, I mean, that's not what you would think. That's not what I thought to begin with, and it seems kind of crazy, but... If you think about it in reality, the United States is a huge country. There are small towns, there are big towns, there are cities, there are inner city, there's, there are places in the um, suburbs. Everybody has different access to health care in this country. And they had to give us the lowest level that was actually acceptable to treat a certain condition, whether it be surgical or medical. I find a problem with that term now when doctors say to me or to my patients, I'm going to offer you the standard of care. I'm going to give you what the standard of care dictates. Well, to me, that says, I'm going to do as little as possible to help you. I'm going to follow the guidelines, and the guidelines have problems, which we'll discuss, but I'm just going to do that. I'm not going to do the best treatment that's out there. I'm not going to do the newest, most acceptable treatment, but I'm just going to do the lowest level of treatment. So when um, I started uh, n- understanding what this meant, I looked at taking boards. We take boards as physicians. We have to go in and be tr- tr- tested to see if we can be board certified. They give us questions about our specialty work, and they follow the guidelines. So what we do is we, when we're doctors and we're going to take the boards, we study and memorize the guidelines which give us the lowest standard of care. And 
sadly, the guidelines are about 10 years behind because it takes a long time to become a guideline. Everybody has to agree on it. And then it has to be accepted by the specialty group. So we're always 10 years behind in our guidelines. However, doctors are minute by minute learning things and new things come out and we use them and they're successful, they're better than what we had 10 years ago. And so one of these uh, examples that I got to witness personally was that when I took my boards, or reboards, in 1998, they asked me a question about PMS. The question was, is PMS a disease? Well, it, in 1998, we knew that it was a disease that we were treating it with antidepressants, which is the wrong treatment now. But at that time, it was being treated and accepted as an illness and something that should be treated in women. However, the true answer, the answer that got you an acceptable or got you a point, basically, is the answer was no. It's not a disease, because that's the old answer. We had learned a lot in 10 years, and we had learned that PMS was actually a condition that had to be treated. However, the guidelines and the standard of care had not changed. And because those of us who had learned things and treated things basically modernly, we had been the modern physicians taking care of people the best we could, we actually found, found ourselves in a position of having it marked wrong. So that was not just the only thing that was marked wrong for us. When I took um, oral boards back in the 80s, I, found, I, 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 had a bad, I had a bad experience because I was asked by four men who asked me oral, oral questions about my practice. And I had been doing removal of ovaries through the laparoscope. Well, everybody does that now. And at that time, everybody had been doing it for five years. And I was doing all of my ovarian removals that weren't cancer through a laparoscope, which was the newest treatment. So women didn't have to have incisions. They didn't have to have big scars. That was my motivation. And it was a very, it was a better operation because women didn't have a lot of scarring inside when you did it that way. That was my answer to them. Their answer was, the guidelines say you shouldn't take an ovary out through the laparoscope. Now, since then, that guideline has changed. I was right, but I was not right in the eyes of these men who were following guidelines that were old. So I had a problem with passing that particular question. So you can see the problem. Medicine is always changing. New things are coming up. They're proven to be true. They're proven like, just like testosterone. Testosterone is many studies that are not acknowledged by the current guidelines for women, but it is very effective and is helping thousands and thousands of women. But the American College of OBGYN still says Testosterone is not a hormone for women. Testosterone shouldn't be given to women. And I find that to be a huge problem. They're following guidelines that are old. Guidelines are also the minimum that you can get uh, when you are going to the physician. So those are two examples of how, as a physician, I found guidelines to be out of date. And the people that decide on the guidelines <laughs> are are usually men, and they're usually old, and they're usually retired, who are at the top of the American College of OBGYN, some women at the top, but they were trained by men. So they, they practice medicine, or they did practice medicine a long time ago, and medicine is rapidly changing and rapidly improving. So when they accept the guidelines, they look at it with an eye to the past. When we're living in the present and offering our patients um, medicine and surgery that is current and and on the edge of the future. So those are those are just examples of why guidelines should not be followed. We should follow more than the guidelines. We should follow the research. We should follow the current practice. But that's not what we do in America. So that's always a problem when you're talking to your doctor. You have a disconnect. And even when I talk to my doctor about things, I have, I have disconnects when I don't think about when he says, oh, I'm going to 
do the, what the standard treatment is. And I say, so what is that? And he tells me, and I said, so have there been new treatments? Has anything come forward since that was, that was deemed the standard or the standard of care? Well, yeah, but, well, that tells me I'm not getting necessarily the best or the most efficient treatment. And it should, it should ring a bell when they say, I'm following guidelines, what's the problem? Or I'm following standard of care, what's the problem? Well, the problem is that's the least he can do for you, the least she can do for you. They should be following current therapy and the best therapy that's for you, which may not be what the guidelines tell, tell them because guidelines are made for everybody and you're an individual. Individual treatment should be, and we're, and we're coming close to that now. Now medicine is, is really entering the age of personalized medicine where we have one answer for this person and a different answer for that person looking at the whole person. So we are we're kind of on the edge of, of a new generation of doctors who are actually honing your, your uh, treatment for you. But once again, the lingo is misleading. I also have a problem with politicians who use standard of care because they usually use it in a way to take away expensive treatments from us Standard of care is the lowest possible level of care. So standard of care may be an x-ray or a CT scan, whereas the best standard of care to find a tumor in the abdomen would be an MRI. But they use it so that insurance companies that give them money, support their campaigns, will actually, <laughs> I mean, it's just so sad, will actually make more money off of your what you pay them because they'll deny you the best care when you could actually have an MRI get a better or more accurate diagnosis and a faster diagnosis than you might when you get a CT scan or a flat plate x-ray. So politicians use these terms also. The minute that that comes out of their mouth, you should go, ah, this is, this is going to be a lie or a manipulative move to take away my ability to have the best health care. So when you're communicating with your doctor for the options that uh, they are giving you, you should always say, not, not just accept, oh, this treatment. You should say, what are the other options? What else could you do? Is there a new procedure for this? How long does this surgery take? How long will I be out of work? Um, what... Uh, what are the side effects? What are the risks of this procedure versus this procedure? And if they start giving you that this is the standard of care, say, well, is there anything out there that's better? And that's something that I ran into myself as a patient uh, recently when I, uh, I have an atrial arrhythmia and I need to have an ablation of that arrhythmia. I went to one doctor who said, I, I had done some research, of course, I went to one doctor who said, I do it this way. You have to be in the hospital for three days first. You have to be in the hospital three days after. You take these drugs. You'll have to be on um, anticoagulants for a very long time afterwards. The procedure takes eight hours um, under anesthesia. And I, 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 I actually knew that there was a different procedure that took less time and did not require hospitalization for that amount of time. So I asked him a rhetorical question. I knew the answer, and I just said, isn't there anything else that's newer that could keep me out of the hospital? Because, frankly, the shorter period of time that you're in the hospital, the better. You, there are infections in the hospital. There's all kinds of things that can happen in a hospital. It's better that you get better and get out. So I was trying to get the shortest hospital stay. And he said, no. And I knew that that wasn't true. So I basically said, thank you very much, goodbye, and I left his office never to see him again. I then found another doctor who I interviewed, and I asked him the same questions. And he said, yeah, I do, I'll do whichever procedure, whether this long one or this short one, they're both effective. They, they, in fact, the shorter procedure is more effective and is newer, and it, it will actually give you less recurrence of this so you don't have to have another surgery, which I don't want to have two for one, and no one does. So I said, oh, that's great. So which one would you suggest? He said, you pick. He said, it's up to you. 
said, they're equal to me. I do both of them the same, uh, with the same accuracy. You can, you can tell me. And he had a one-day hospital stay after the surgery. Now, that's a huge difference. And the other doctor told me that wasn't even, that wasn't even available. And his, his uh, treatment was standard of care. But this n newer treatment had been done for many years, and it was better. So that's how you investigate and how you ask. And if they're not forthcoming, you probably need a different doctor. If your doctor says to you something that you don't really understand, you, you need to ask for definitions because we use lingo. Sometimes we don't even know we're saying things that you don't understand, so we sometimes have to define them. But if it comes down to this procedure, this medicine, this medicine, you can always ask this question. Would your mother, would you treat your mother, your sister, your child, your spouse with this procedure or this procedure? And in general, that gets them thinking about the best procedure, the most accurate, the safest, the most effective, the uh, least side effects, and then they will tell you what they prefer. And that's always a good question to ask. It makes a psychological, it makes a cold decision a, a very personal decision. And it makes them think about what they would choose if they could choose a procedure for someone in their family. And I think you get the best answers that way. I think you get the best treatments that way. And I think you're protected in the, in the best possible way. So run from a doctor who won't explain things, who will just give you the standard of care, the lowest level of care, who will just follow guidelines blindly, who won't make his treatment or her treatment for you, and find a doctor who will, because there are doctors out there, and you have a choice. We still have a choice in America to choose our doctors. And you can find a doctor who will give you a higher level of care than just standard of care. So please listen so that you are protected and that you receive the best medical care possible. Protect yourself. Thank you for listening today. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth.